us through our Lord Jesus. Thank you for our time to be together, and thank you for all these brothers and sisters that have come to uh, learn more about how to know your word better. Um, thank you for uh, all of us, wherever we are, in our understanding of these things, whether we're reviewing them or whether we know them well and, uh, and are driving them home or whether maybe we've heard them for the first time. Uh, I just pray that you would help us to grasp these things and to humbly uh, receive them and that by them you would help us to understand your word better and to know you more and to live out what you've called us to be, to be more like our Lord Jesus. And so we ask all of this in his great name. Amen. All right. So uh, for those of you that did the homework, I'm curious how it went. Did anybody get more than 30 observations? <laughs> Any hand? Oh, oh, what? Uh, uh? 31. 31? Do I have 32? 32, 32. Yeah, yeah, I see that. Do I have 33, 33, 33? Yeah, 33, 34. 34. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah, Court, Courtney was like 500, you know. <laughs> Very cool. How many did you get, Jack? 31. Thir oh, 31. All right, we got to how many, Michael? Well, I put bullets. I didn't want to know the actual number. Oh, okay. All right. You just know it was more than 30? Okay. How about you, Tim? How many? 35. And 35. All right, Courtney. 33. 33. All right, all right. I should have had a prize or something, but that's great. I mean, um, Take, that takes a lot of work you know you you kind of go into it overwhelmed and uh, as you get going you get a little confident and then you probably come down to those last 10 or so and uh, it's pretty tough uh, but kind of once you cross that threshold you may be able to get some more so that's great we're gonna have another assignment like that actually a couple more like that um, next time not the homework for this coming week but the following one so you'll get to do more with that but it'll be a bigger passage okay not just one verse and there's there's no minimum on it so well today we're going to pump the brakes like I said last time before we get into looking at bigger passages of Scripture we talked about observing sentences and um, before we go on to look at paragraphs and books and, and looking at those larger units, what we're going to do is slow down and emphasize how important context is. And uh, you may remember me saying this before as I'm preaching, that context is king, especially when you're approaching a difficult subject. You better remind yourself of that, that the context determines meaning. Um, Gordon Fee and, and Doug Stewart, there should be an S after his name, Dougla. That's a weird name. They remind us that there's two basic questions that you need to ask every passage. You need to ask questions that relate to the content, and we've begun to do that already. We wanted to get our feet wet into that. We looked at how to do that. We've done an exercise with that. But we also need to ask questions that relate to context. And um, we're all familiar with the soundbite media, especially this time of year when it's uh, election season. Um, you know, it's easy to take a little soundbite out of someone's speech or statement and spin it however you want and make someone say something they didn't really say, right? That kind of freaks me out sometimes when I think of what people could do with my sermons if they wanted to. Um, but you have any kind of media online, people can grab a hold of that and they can spin it. And when they do that, they're taking the statement out of context, right? We use that terminology all the time. Um, you'll hear politicians defending themselves. You have to look at the context of the statement. And when we're looking at scripture, we have to be very careful of context because a lot of times Bible teachers will take verses out of context. In fact, most of what goes by the name preaching nowadays is just that. It's just stringing together a bunch of verses out of context. And most of what's said is true, but a lot of it is not from whatever those verses were. They're just stringing text together, proof text for whatever their topic is. And if you did the reading, you'll note that the author even has a little section on that. 
I felt like the section was a little out of place because the book's not about preaching, it's about hermeneutics, but I thought it was helpful to see what happens when you don't take context into account. And sometimes that can lead to uh, false teaching and even heresy. So I footnoted for you there how the Mormons uh, have built their whole doctrine of baptism for the dead from that one verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 29. And if you, re you want to know what that means, go listen to my sermon on it. I'm confident I know, okay? But remember, uh, there's over 40 different interpretations of that verse. But the Mormons, you know, they think they know and build a whole doctrine, and they think it's baptizing people by proxy who have already died to somehow um, give them salvation. I mean, what a weird doctrine. So if you're not careful and you take things out of context, not only may it not be true, but it may be dangerous. And so we really need to take a step back and focus on how important context is. Context is king. Don't ever forget that. So we're going to talk about word studies, but I want to talk about context first because uh, we're going to emphasize how the context even is going to play a large part as we look at word studies. They really go hand in hand. Um, so note there that there, there's a couple of kinds of context that we need to talk about. We mentioned this in the introductory lesson, um, but there's historical context, and we're going to look at that in depth in just a couple of weeks. But uh, what we're going to look at tonight is literary context. But if you, uh, let me turn this thing on here. If, if you look at this little chart, um, you have external context, which is cultural background, historical background, geographical background. We're going to talk about all of that under that umbrella of the historical context. And then as you enter the Bible, though, there's an internal context. There's the, the entire Bible, the New Testament, the author's writings, the entire book, the paragraph, the text. So you sort of funnel down to the context of whatever passage you're looking at. We're going to talk about that more in just a moment. But before we do, I just want to say a word about genre, because genre is, is extremely important. Um, you know, I love how God gave us the Bible. I love systematic theology books. Um, some I love more than others. But if you've ever read one, um, they're kind of boring at times, right? Because they're, you know, this heading, this topic, this section... Um, that's not how God gave us his word. He gave us his word in all sorts of different genres, in history, poetry, prophecy, uh, letters, all sorts of different ways. That's really what a genre is. It's a, it's a different type of communication. And he did that um, so that we would see all of the different ways that he communicates to us in, in this really rich way. Um, and so as we look at the genres of the Old Testament, you can just see uh, that there's a number of, of these, and some of them overlap. Um, and even the way the, the Hebrew Bible was laid out originally was a bit different than this. But this is, you know, the basic categories of the Old Testament. Law, and, and there's obviously history combined in those first five books. Uh, there's, there's all the history books, poetry, or the wisdom books, we call them, uh, the major prophets and the minor prophets. Um, and then when you look at the New, Testa New Testament, you have the Gospels, which are another particular genre. They're kind of like biographies almost. Um, and then you have that one book of history, which is Acts. And then a lot of epistles, 13 of them by Paul, and then the general epistles. Maybe 14, if you believe Paul wrote um, Hebrews. And then apocalyptic, which is prophecy, but a little bit different nuance when you come to apocalyptic. So a lot of different genres. And as the authors of our text say, I really like this illustration they gave, that just like when you're playing a game, um, the rules depend on what game you're playing. The same is with the, the genre of scripture. There's general rules of interpretation that we're learning but when you come to these different genres sometimes the rules are are tweaked a little bit according to what genre you're looking at 
we're going to talk about that more down the road. Um, the principles that we're looking at now are all exegesis. So remember, we're still in step one of the interpretive journey. We're going to be there for even another couple weeks. Remember, that's the biggest step. We're doing that spade work. So those kind of things, uh, the, the basic principles we're learning apply across the board. But there are some differences that will come up. And I'll just give you, for instance, in case you're curious right now, if you think about the book of Acts, it's history. And history tells us what happened, right? An epistle, on the other hand, tells us what to do. And so when you're interpreting those, there's some different rules. You can't go to the book of Acts and expect that everything that happened there, you're supposed to do because you're not being told to do anything. You're learning what happened. Now, there may be principles there that apply to you. Uh, think about us going through the book of Ruth. It, it's history as well, right? There's principles there that apply to us, but there's not a thus saith the Lord uh, in a sense like uh, there are in the epistles. As we went through 1 Corinthians, there were so many things that were like, you know, when I preached that, I would say, you must do this, right? Th this is incumbent upon you. Um, and that's because those are two different genres. So we'll look at some of that as we uh, get down the road. But let's go back to, to layers of context. Um, I like to say that <laughs> context is kind of like lasagna. Um it has lots of rich layers. Um, I say that about words sometimes, you'll, you'll note. I like to call some words lexical lasagnas because they just have layers of meaning. But not just words, but, but the layers of meaning of context, um, not layers of meaning, but layers of understanding that we find in Scripture are rich. So here again, we have a similar diagram to the other one. You have the particular word, and that word is within a phrase, within a sentence, within a paragraph, within a section of the book, maybe a chapter, uh, within that whole book. And then there's books by the same author, multiple books. Think of Paul, who wrote, you know, 13 epistles. And then you have um, other books of, of the same sort of genre, other epistles, perhaps, if you're looking at that. You have the context of the Old Testament as opposed to the New Testament. There's differences there. And you have the whole Bible. And then on top of that, you have other ancient literature that um, doesn't help you interpret the Bible per se, but it can help you when you're looking at historical issues. And uh, even as we look at word studies, sometimes we get helped by ancient sources of other dialects that are similar to Greek and Hebrew and so forth. So lots of layers of context. And so what our task is, is to identify the surrounding context of our passage. And it makes a lot of sense that the most important layers of context are gonna be found closest to the text, right? It's gonna be within that uh, sentence or paragraph or larger unit of the, the book, or perhaps the whole book itself, if it's a shorter book, like Philemon. <laughs> Philemon is, you know, maybe a couple paragraphs long, right? So maybe the whole book's gonna give you the context, but typically it's gonna be a unit that is smaller. Now, how do you do this? How do you figure out what the, what the surrounding context is for your particular text? Um, there's a couple helps with that. One is to use translation. So remember, that's our basic tool, a good translation. And translations can do a lot of things for us, not just helping us understand the text, but sometimes helping us how to break up the text into um, units of thought. Um, so if you have your Bible open, you know, you'll, you'll notice that there's headings typically. Um, in, in the newer translations anyways. There'll be headings above passages. Sometimes my kids will be reading the Bible and they'll read the heading and I have to remind them, well, wait, that, that's not the verse. Don't, you know, don't worry about reading, just skip that. <laughs> but those headings are there to help you break up the text into manageable pieces to kind of understand what's going on. And a lot of times those headings are helpful. A, a lot of times they, they are, are really giving you a jump start on what's in that text. 
Uh, you think about chapter breaks, even beyond those, those can be very helpful. Um, but remember, those aren't inspired. And as you see in your footnote, they're not always right. Um, you know, 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 should be 1 Corinthians 10.34. Um, <laughs> I don't know why they did the chapter break there, but must have had a, a decent reason. But uh, you can't rely on it all the time, but those are helpful. Also look for changes in the text. So similar to what we talked about last time, there's words that are transitionary, therefore, then, but, and so forth. We'll look more into that next week when we look at how to read paragraphs and discourses or longer sections. So that's how we identify context. Again, we'll, we'll dig into that more, but just driving home how important context is. Context really is key. So now let's dive into to word studies in our time remaining. And, um, you know, like I said, I wanted to zoom out a little bit. Now we're zooming back in on particular words. And this is important because words are the basic building blocks of sentences, which form phrases or paragraphs and so forth, right? And that's how we get meaning. So words are important. And if you have a faithful translation, as I've told you, um, those would suffice for the most part. But when you do a word study, a lot of times what you'll wind up getting is nuances of meaning that you would never see in the translation. And they can give you a really deeper, richer understanding of the text. Like I said, it's kind of like watching TV in color rather than black and white. Or if you're a millennial, it's like, 4K rather than something, you know. I, I don't know where we're at now with all of that. I do know that I've watched Game 7 of the 2001 World Series. I, I don't know how many times I've watched that game, but whenever I go back and watch it, it's amazing to me how fuzzy the resolution is compared to what we have now and how we didn't realize it back then. You know, and I remember when I got a newer TV, I finally like saved up, got this new TV, one of those flat ones and I was watching and it actually made me sick to my stomach watching it because it was so clear like I felt nauseous watching it so anyhow that's what word studies can do for your Bible reading it can make you make you feel nauseous <laughs> where are we going with this anyways so back to context and how it affects word studies uh, look at what fee and Stewart say Words only have meaning in sentences, and biblical sentences, for the most part, only have clear meaning in relation to preceding and succeeding sentences. And so when we're doing word studies, we're looking for the meaning of the word, but what we'll find is that the context actually plays into the meaning of the word. So it kind of goes both ways. The word helps you understand meaning, uh, but the context is also going to help you understand meaning of the word. And when you get that right, you really lock on to something rich. So as we're looking into doing word studies, we're going to talk about how to do word studies. And we're actually going to walk through one together. Uh, it's, it's fairly simple, um, but I want to show you how to do it in case you've never done it before. You may not know where to start. But before we do that... Um, just want to note some cautions of word studies uh, because uh, when you engage in word studies, it's easy to come to conclusions that aren't necessarily true. Um, one of those is a failure to consider the original languages. So when you're doing word studies, if you're only studying words in, in the English, so if you only use your translations or you only use an English dictionary and things like that, you're forgetting that there's underlying uh, Hebrew or Greek words, and in a few cases, Aramaic words, underlying those English words. Now that may freak you out because you don't know those original languages. Um, that's why you need to go to Tony's class, right? No, I'm, I'm kidding. You, that can be helpful to have a better understanding of those, but you don't have to be an expert in those because we have so many good tools, and we're gonna talk about tools in just a minute. Um, but if you fail to take into account those original languages, 
you'll uh, fail to take into account that one Hebrew or Greek word may be translated with several different English words. Um, so you'll have the same word that has uh, a translation uh, with different English words, and you're going to get yourself all garbled up and confused. And conversely to that, um, several different Hebrew or Greek words may be translated using the same English word. And so depending on the context, uh, you have to look at the situation and you have to take those into account. So that's one caution. The second one is finding meaning in etymology. Etymology is the study of the history of words. I love etymology. It's kind of exciting to trace the history of, of words. Um, and uh, it can be helpful because a lot of times those roots of words add a lot of color and meaning to the word. But what happens a lot of times is that the word will be in a different form. You know, there'll be a root of the word, but added to that will be a preposition or something like that. You'll have a compound word. So if you try to get meaning just from the root of the word, you may be way off course because however that word was modified may drastically change its meaning. So you have to look at its particular form and usage in its context. A third caution is reading meaning back into the text. Um, sometimes you can you know, look at a word, and, um, and, and especially when you start looking at Greek words, uh, it's kind of exciting because you realize, oh, that word is where we get our word such and such, right? I think the author uses the, the word uh, dunamis, uh, as an example in the book. And dunamis is translated power oftentimes. Um, that's in your homework, by the way. So boom, I just already gave you an answer. Um, but dunamis, if you think about that word, oh, that's where we get our word dynamite, right? So a lot of times, uh, you know, you'll, you'll kind of bring that back into the text. Well, dynamite is a little bit different than what the Bible's talking about when it uses the word dunamis, right? Dynamite is a, is a substance that blows things up. Um, we're not really talking about that kind of explosive power, but there is a nuance there that might be helpful, that might give some color to the word. You just have to be careful that you're not reading that back into the text. You're letting the text speak for itself. Another caution is assigning multiple meanings to the word. So a lot of times, um, you know, words have semantic ranges. They can mean various things that all sort of overlap. And um, if you try to make a word mean all of those things in one context, that's obviously not what the author intended. Unless he's doing a play on words, sometimes that can happen. I footnoted that there for you. Sometimes it could be a figure of speech and the author is, is intending a double meaning or something like that. But that's not how we typically communicate regularly. So be careful with that. That you don't try to make a word mean all of those things. You have to decide what is the meaning in this particular context. And then a final caution is finding meaning in the number of times the word is used. Um, so again, words have a semantic range. So the word may have different meanings in those other passages. So you have to look at each passage and see what it means in that particular context. Um, it may have one of those various different meanings in its semantic range. So don't just think that, oh, it's used 20 times in the New Testament and it means the same thing every time. That's, that would be false. All right, so let's talk about which words you should study. Um, it, it's not necessary to do a word study on every word. I remember in seminary, <laughs> one of my professors in a Greek exegesis, he, he, you know, we were talking about word studies, and uh, somebody asked the question, um, like, well, how do you know which words you should do a study on? And he said, well, all of them. <laughs> and so we had to do these exegetical digests of every single word of texts. Uh, which was just crazy. Um, but some professors are like that. He also, you know, he's the kind of guy who in our New Testament introduction class, which covers like 
so much stuff that it make your mind blown. Uh, you know, he doesn't hand out notes like this. He just talks the whole time and you're scribbling notes and then he says, okay, the, the test is on Friday and you ask what the test's gonna be on. And he says, well, everything. <laughs> well, what do you mean everything? Yeah, everything you read, everything I said, the footnotes, you know, okay. So don't worry, you don't have to do that. You can pick out words. Um, and the way you know which words to pick out are pretty obvious from your observation. Okay, sometimes when you're looking at a passage, it, it's just obvious to everybody in the room. Um, but let me just give you some hints. One, one of these is words that are unclear, difficult, or puzzling. O obviously, if you don't understand what the word is, you need to look it up. <laughs> and especially if it's an English word that, that you know, you're having trouble with in the first place, you might just have to look up the English word and, uh, and dig in. Repeated words, we noted that. A lot of times a word is repeated, so you want to dig in a little more. I mentioned a couple times in our study of Ruth that the word return uh, was used 11 times. And just in my observation phase, you know, I'm underlining that word, and I know immediately I'm going to need to dig into that word. It seems pretty clear what it's saying, returning to the land, but, it, but there's something going on with that word in the context that the author is trying to communicate. And as I brought out in the sermon, it's not just returning to the land physically, but there's a communication of repentance there, right? And you find, oh, that word is used in a theological sense elsewhere to mean repentance. So you're going to want to dig into those words that are repeated. Also, figures of speech. Sometimes uh, there's a word or a phrase that you might want to dig into a little deeper because you don't understand it. Uh, we use colloquialisms all the time that we don't mean. I used to use the, the term out of left field all the time. And I never knew what that meant. And um, so one time I looked it up and I loved it because it's a baseball analogy. It just means that you're never going to be able to make an out at first base from left field. Um, you guys probably already knew that, you know. I just, I'm late to the party. But uh, we have those kind of things that we use all the time. So when you go back in time and you have... Hebrew or, or first century idioms and figures of speech, we don't know what those mean a lot of times. And then there are words that are just crucial to the meaning of the passage. And these are the ones that may be a little bit harder to identify, but as you do your observation, they're going to become clear. Um, and as I noted there, they could be repeated words or they may be verbs. Um, they may just be you know a particular word that um, has a prominent place in the meaning. You can see it, you've underlined it. So you'll know which words that need to be studied. All right, so in our remaining time, let's look at how to do a word study. <clears throat> and as you do this, you're gonna have to expand your toolbox. Um, we've talked about a translation as your basic tool. Right? Interpreters need tools, and a translation is your basic tool. Um, so in order to do proper word studies, you're going to have to expand your tool belt, and we're going to talk about a couple of tools that are needed for word studies. There's lots more that you could use, but we're just going to talk about a couple today. And these tools can be found in print or online. Um, and you can find them online for free. You can buy software that is wonderful if you want, but you can find pretty much everything you need online for free. And I encourage you to do that because it's a lot easier. Um, in fact, when I was early on in figuring out how to do expository preaching and what my system was gonna be, um, I realized that I, I, I prefer print books um, and so for commentaries and things like that, I got to have an actual book and a pen in my hand, um, highlighter and whatever. But when it comes to word studies, what you'll find is that you're opening this book and then you're opening that book and you're doing this, and you're doing that, and you're flipping pages and you're flipping back and you're wasting a lot of time with print books when you're doing word studies. But what we have online now is uh, just a click of a button and you've got a whole bunch of stuff right there that does a lot of the work for you. Um, so I invested in some software that does a lot of that. And it really, it does two things. It speeds up the process 
and it also cleans up your desk, <laughs> which is nice. So I have some print copies of some of the things we're going to look at. Uh, they're, they're pretty basic. You've probably already seen these, um, but we're going to look at how to do this online. So with that, I just want to note that on our website, um, Tony's uh, amassed a whole bunch of Bible study tools. So if you didn't realize this, I want to take the opportunity. You go to our website. There's a drop-down menu under Christian Resources, and there's Bible Study Tools. And you click on that, and it'll take you to this page that has a whole bunch of uh, resources. So if you're like, Pastor said to go online, I have no idea where to go. Well, go to our website, and it'll take you right to some of these sources. And um, you may already have a source that you use. That's great. Keep using it. Um, but... What I did is, is use Bible Hub because it's on our site and it's a very simple tool. If you have the book, the authors give you a step-by-step -step, uh, direction on how to use the Step Bible program. Um, and that one's very helpful as well, so you could use that. But we're going to look at how to use Bible Hub as we look at, at word study. So the first step is that you want to look up the verse in parallel translations to see how the word is rendered. That's what we did last time uh, for our assignment, right? I had you look at multiple translations. Um, so you can do this online. So you go to the Bible Hub site, and um, I want to study 1 Corinthians 10, 16. So I'm going to type that into the little search bar and hit enter. And that is going to bring up a list of different translations just by hitting enter. So I don't have to go out and buy a whole bunch of translations. I got them right here. Some of these are kind of weird. I, I never heard of the Berean Standard Bible. I don't know what that is. But um, you'll know the ones that you really want to be looking at because we've talked about those, right? So you're going to see there's the King James, the New King James, the New American Standard. That must be the old one because they got the NASB 95 on there. They got the English Standard Version. They got every one you could want. And so it's the same verse in all of those. And, uh, that, and, and what I'm saying with the word study is you need to just go through and see where your word is and what the different translations do with that word. And you can see some of the differences there. And the word that we're going to home in on in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, by the way, is uh, in the ESV, it's rendered participation. Participation, okay? So can anybody see any differences? And you see the word participation, any differences in the translations? What do you, what do you see? If I see participation, what else do you see? Communion. 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 Sharing. Sharing, okay? So you're already getting different nuances, right? Already in your mind, you're thinking, okay, there's a semantic range of this word. And they're all very similar, but they could be rendered this way according to the translators that have done these translations. All right, so step two is uh, you're going to want to look up the word in a concordance. So uh, this is a, a print version of an exhaustive, Strong's exhaustive concordance, okay? This is the classic Concordance. This is the one that pretty much all of the Bible software free and uh, paid uses. Strong's is, is awesome, okay? Um, and this uh, original one is key to the King James Bible. So you need to be aware that concordances are key to different translations. Like for Caleb's graduation, somebody gave him a really nice print version of the ESV concordance. Uh, which I thought, that's really cool, but I'll never use it. Uh, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. He'll use it, though. Um, so you want to, if you're going to invest in one of these, I would just remind you, get one that's key to your favorite translation, okay? Um, but, again, I would encourage you to do it online. So look up your word in a concordance. And what a concordance is, is a listing of all the words in the Bible, unless it's an abridged aversion, uh, aversion but like the exhaustive, exhaustive means it's got them all in there. And um, even the abridged ones will have all the primary words in the Bible. And so um, you're gonna be able to look up 
your word and get a lot of information. So how do you do that online? Well, we'll go back to Bible Hub. So you go back to the, the main page of Bible Hub and um, I wanna look at the ESV concordance. So I'm gonna click the little, all those letters at the top are different translations I can choose. So I'm gonna click that and then I'm gonna click on Strong's because I know that's the best, right? It's strong. There's also Young's, but Young's is kind of kind of lame. It's not as strong. It's not as strong. So you, so you click on Strong's, and all of a sudden, um, well, you got to enter your your passage in there. Obviously, I skipped that step. So you enter your passage, and then here is going to give you a list of all the words in your passage and it's going to give you some basic information about the passage and i want you to note there that strong's it says strong's greek 2482 is that what that says yeah something like that that's the that's the strong's number okay so there's the hebrew numbers and the greek numbers so you're in the New Testament, so it's going to be Greek. This is the Strong's number, and uh, you'll notice that it's hyperlinked there, so you can click on that, and when you do, it's going to bring up what you have there in your notes. All that information, it's going to give you the original word, so now you know what that word is. I mean, it was on that home page too, but this is kind of just lining it out so you know exactly what you're looking at. The original Greek word, that the translators rendered as either participation or communion or sharing, that word is koinonia. And immediately you've probably heard that word before, right? That's a precious word, koinonia. It gives you the part of speech. It's a noun here in its usage and it's feminine. And you'll remember Tony's class with why that's important if you went to that right and then it gives you the transliteration so it tells you how to say it because when you look at the greek word if you don't know greek you have no idea what that saying but the transliteration is just taking the greek words and bringing them into or uh, the greek letters and bringing them into english if you've heard me preach on baptism <laughs> you remember me harping on that right Baptism is not a translation, it's a transliteration, baptizo, which means to immerse, right? To dip, to die, D-Y, D-Y-E, not D-I-E. Anyways, that's a side note. Even gives you the phonetic spelling so you can sound it out. Do that by yourself though, okay? Um, and then it gives you the basic definition and notice this is different than any of those translations we looked at. This definition is fellowship. So now you have another nuance of the word. And it gives you various usages here. Um, partnership, contributory help, participation, sharing. There's all those words we've seen. Spiritual fellowship, fellowship in the spirit. So it'll give you just kind of a really brief idea of the nuances of this word. So see how helpful a concordance is? Um, now if you did that in the print version, it'd be a little harder because you'd have to look it up alphabetically. And then, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you can see this up here, but look how small that print is. You gotta get your, you know, your glasses out and scan down. And then when you find the number, you gotta flip to the back and you gotta make sure you're in the right area in the back and find, the number and so forth. So doing it online is just really helpful, saves a lot of time. But if you're a dyed the wool print person, well, there you go. God bless you, okay? All right, so you have all that information. Then what you wanna do is uh, look up the parallel passage, uh, parallel passages, because there's gonna be a number of, of these with this word. And you're going to want to note the following things. So how do you do that? Well, you go back to that main page and, and up at the top, instead of clicking on the Strong's number, you're going to click on the transliteration of the original word. See how that's hyperlinked? So you're going to click on that. 
And that's going to bring up all of these usages. And it's going to be categorized like koinonia is used nine times in this particular form. It's used 19 times in a different form. And then additional entries will be different forms of the word. So when you add all those up, this word is used a ton in the New Testament. But what you have on the left is its particular form. So we're talking about the noun form, right? The form you have in your passage. And so you're going to want to note the various translations of the word. Um, you're going to want to note the context. So note how there's a number of translations there. And they give you the various translations of the word and its, and its usages in each verse. And then you're going to want to look up those passages and look at their contexts. And that's where it's going to take some time. So that's where you're either going to want to, you know, use your, your Bible software or maybe just have your, your print Bible open and look those up and do a little reading around there and get a feel for the context of those verses to see if it's similar to your passage. By the way, I picked this verse because this is a hard verse, okay? Um, you're going to want to take special note of the other uses in the same book. So if that word is used again in the same book, you're going to want to make a note of that. And you're going to want to make a special note of the uses of that word in other books by the same author. So this book is by the Apostle Paul. So where else does he use that word? And that's going to be important because different authors will use words differently sometimes. Any questions on any of that? I don't want to go too fast. Pretty straightforward. What is the verse? Actually? First Corinthians ten sixteen. Oh, okay. I should have noted it in your notes. I'm sorry. It's got to be some mystery, you know. Got to do some work there, like spoon feeding you here. All right. Um, and then you're going to look up the word in the lexicon. A lexicon is a, is basically a dictionary. So. What's cool is you go back to that main page, click on the Strong's number again, and once you get familiar with this, you can do all of this, a lot of this all at once, because when you click on that number again, you go back to that page and you just scroll down the page. That's all I did, I just scrolled down a little bit. You have Thayer's Greek lexicon and the entry for this. And as you look at that entry, what you want to do is note the different possible meanings. And they're usually noted in these lexicons by a number one or at least a bold type. Um, so you see that number one bold, number two bold. And you see there's, there's a bit of difference in those definitions, but they're, they're similar, a little bit different. And you want to look at the various renderings that they give. And then you also want to look at the scripture examples provided for each meaning. So all that garbly gook there is, is Greek phrases, but next to them are the, the passages, right? So you can look up each one of those. And, and your passage is going to be really important. So notice in the first one, you see your passage there, right? You see your verse, 1 Corinthians 10, 16. So that will sort of help you give an idea, uh, give you an idea that the writer of this lexicon viewed that word that's in your passage as defined by number one. And he's pretty smart, so I'd say there's quite a bit of weight there, right? He's smarter than you. But... <laughs> Maybe, maybe not. We're trying to do our own work here, but we're, we're using tools. We're using friends. So you're looking at those scripture examples, and you're looking some of those up, and you're getting a feel for the, the different ways this is used according to those definitions. Now, this Bible software may have more uh, lexicons than this. Um, 
So, so you can look at more. If it doesn't, there's other places you could find them, and you could look that word up in, in other lexicons, so you could see what a variety of them say. And by the way, I footnoted for you some of the, the tools that are kind of standard for, for this if you want to really go in depth. You might have to pay for some of those. But for just a typical word study, again, you can find what you need online. All right, step four, what you want to do now is compare the contextual examples provided in the lexicon with those you discovered in your concordance work. And you're going to find that a lot of those overlap. So now you're going to kind of compare that work that you did in the concordance with the lexicon and see how those match up. And by this time, you're kind of already figuring out what this word means, right? You're, you're, you're pretty much getting a handle on it. And then you're going to want to look at circles of context. So what is that? Well, it's back to that whole issue that the context is king, and your word is going to be um, influenced in meaning by the context around it. So... Now you have to take all the stuff you've learned about this word and how it's used variously and what its various meanings are, and you got to really dig into the context and say, okay, what does this mean here? So turn over in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 10 and look at verse 16. I chose this word because, you know, this is a harder passage and this word, if you'll note, in verses 16 and following, occurs several times. And then there's a synonym, which is actually a different word, but it's the word partake. And it's synonymous with particip participation. So as you're looking at this, um, and you're looking at the flow of, of this and, and the context of what Paul is talking about, it's clear that he's talking about some sort of fellowship or participation or sharing because he's talking, he, he's, he's mentioning the Lord's Supper and he's talking about demons and what goes on in an idol temple and he's contrasting those and comparing those. So as you're looking at this word, you can realize that this word that, that the rendering that the translators chose for the ESV is actually a very good one. I mean, you could use sharing or communion, but participation has kind of a flavor to it that, you know, kind of means that you're, you're in this, right? Um, you could commune from a distance or share from a distance, but participation is kind of the idea of your hands are in the pot. And that's what Paul is communicating here. He, he is wanting us to understand that when, you know, in this first century context, when you went to this idol temple for Johnny's birthday party and they were sacrificing to an idol, you can call it what you want, but you're actually participating in idol worship, right? So now you see this word is very important for our understanding. And I think that the, the rendering in the ESV is spot on. And so that can give you con confidence and if you're teaching this passage, you know, you can kind of talk about that. This word has shades of meaning, but here's what Paul is trying to really get across. So do you see how that adds color to your understanding? I mean, we've done this very quickly, but you can just see already um, before participation. Okay, but now you're really seeing uh, kind of underneath the hood here a little bit. And so that's what you're doing with word studies. And that's how to do one in Bible Hub. So if you look at your packet, I stapled your assignments to it this time because last time we were finding um, paper clips all over the, the worship center. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, I'm just going to staple them this time. Uh, so you'll have to rip those off, or if you're one of those meticulous people that's OCD, you'll have to take the staple out very carefully. Um, <laughs> however you prefer, but those two assignments are going to walk you through 
uh, some principles of word study. And I think you'll have a ton of fun doing them. And so I encourage you to use uh, some sort of online uh, program. So go to our website, or if you like, you know, there's Blue Letter Bible. Maybe you use that. There's uh, Bible Gateway. I don't know what all it has um, there. Uh, there's the STEP program. If you have the book, it, it really shows you how to use that. If you've never used those kind of software before, it may take you some time um, to work through them, but it's worth the investment of your time. And again, like I said, if you're a print person, well, go for it, okay? It's just going to take you quite a bit of time. All right, any final questions as we wrap up here? All right, well, let me close this out and then uh, stick around for Rob. There's coffee in the back. It's on the very back, the little pot back there, if you want coffee. All right. Lord, thank you again for our time. Lord, thank you for the day in which we live. There is so much wrong with the world around us, and yet we have such an awesome privilege in this time that we live to have access to your word in so many different uh, translations in our own language and so many tools that are available to us, so much time that can be saved by clicking buttons. We think about uh, men in the past who uh, developed uh, tools like these with nothing uh, but just their, their Bible and just those original uh, languages. And it's, it's really mind-blowing. And we can benefit from all of that with the click of a button. So help us to do that. Help us to be uh, Bereans and dig into your word. And uh, as we do that, as we began, Lord, would you work in our hearts and uh, help us not to do this just to gain knowledge, but to gain knowledge that is going to help us grow and to help us build others up in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.